Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the second day of the 2021 TUC LGBT Workers Conference. Hope you all enjoyed yesterday. We're going to have another good day today. My name is Maria Exel and I'm the chair of the TUC LGBT Plus Workers Committee and a general council member where I represent my union, the CWU. I'm very pleased to say this afternoon that we will be starting with, with speeches from Nancy Kelly, Chief Executive of Stonewall, and Charlotte Nichols MP, Shadow Minister for, for Women and Equalities. Please note, before we begin the proceedings, that we have a hashtag for this conference. It's hashtag TUC LGBT. That's really original. That's hashtag TUC LGBT. Without further ado, brings me great, great pleasure to introduce the stage is yours, Nancy Kelly, Chief Executive of Stonewall. Over to you. What a, what a wonderful introduction, Maria. Thank you. So, um, hello everyone. My name is Nancy. Um, I'm the Chief Executive of, of Stonewall. My pronouns are she and her, and it is an incredible um, privilege to have the opportunity to speak to you all today. Uh, many of you will know Stonewall, but I'm just going to say a few words about about us. And I think the first thing for me is that at Stonewall, we can imagine a world where LGBTQ people everywhere are free to be themselves and to live their life to the full. You know, we set that bar high. We're a human rights organization. We're working to bring that world about by campaigning for change, by forming really deep partnerships across society to sustain change and working with a global movement of LGBTQ people, our friends, our families, our colleagues, our allies. And when I think about the history of the organization, I think, well, we've traveled this incredible path from section 28, the complete suppression and erasure of LGBTQ identities in schools to today, where in England, Wales and Scotland, we're getting ready to, uh, to deliver through the national curriculum, teaching around LGBTQ identities, families and relationships as part of an inclusive uh, sex and relationship education programme. That same path has taken us from a world where our relationships were criminalised to one where we've got equal rights to love, for those of us that want to, equal rights to marry or to have children. And I think we're really proud of, of who we are and what we've achieved with the movement, but we also feel really conscious that more change is desperately needed. And in particular, we really recognise that the gains of the LGBTQ rights movement here in the UK and around the world have primarily been felt by the most privileged among us. And we're absolutely committed in our new strategy to focus on equity and working in part, working with partners in the movement to defend and to protect protect rights and freedoms of the most marginalized among us. So trans and non-binary people, LGBTQ people of color, disabled LGBT people, those of us that live in poverty. I want to really recognize also, having celebrated Stonewall a little bit, which is my job always to do, the power of the union movement in kind of transforming LGBTQ people's rights. So I'm a proud trade unionist. I spent many years working as a shop steward. That experience taught me a lot. Um, and it taught me a lot about um, really how to be a leader, but also how to organize for progressive change. And I really recognize and honor that really central role that the union movement has played in transforming my life and the lives of other LGBTQ people. And I guess I really want to recognize a couple of parts of that. Firstly, that economic rights and economic justice matter profoundly for our communities here in the UK and around the world. It's not just about social rights. Too many of us are still trapped in poverty or are working in workplaces where we don't have dignity, security, safety. I also think it's this business about the way in which unions drive inclusive workplaces and shape those social and cultural norms at work. And they create the space for people to work alongside each other who don't share our identity. We don't share our exp all experiences. We know that those inclusive workplaces really drive down in institutional and individual prejudice and shift cultural norms across society. I really believe that the union movement and Stonewall shares a vision of an equitable, inclusive, supportive workplace where all of us have the protection and support we need to thrive. And I think we can together imagine just endless potential for our communities. 
And I want to honour the kind of work that the union movement has done and the force that it's been, particularly in recent years, in terms of rallying and organising around trans rights and supporting your trans members. And I think that has been and will be critically important, and particularly the work you're doing to combat far-right anti-trans narratives in and beyond the workplace. And particularly, I want to pay tribute to your trans members who have been bravely standing up for their rights against organised campaigns from outside, but also from inside the movement that tries to break down the solidarity that's been at the heart of LGBTQ organising. Nobody does organising and mobilising like LGBTQ folk in trade unions. We are out there, we are in our communities, our workplaces, we are persuading, negotiating, campaigning, winning. And I think with the fights ahead, we need to keep working together in unity to protect LGBTQ people's rights and create a world where we can all be free. When I think about where we are today, that progress we've built, the consensus we've built, and that future we imagine, it's under threat. We know that securing our rights and freedoms has always been an uphill struggle. You know, in the fight for equal age of consent, in the fight against Section 28, you know, in the fight for equal marriage, we were flooded with toxic attacks on our community, in the media, in the mouths of political leaders and public figures. We were painted as disgusting, as immoral, as dangerous, as a social contagion that was a risk to children and vulnerable adults. And we won those fights because we organized together within communities, within power struggles power structures, we persuaded people, we told our story, and we asked for and secured political leadership. And, and right at this point in time, we're being dragged into a culture war that is not of our making. The global anti-gender movement is powerful, it is organised, it's incredibly well-funded, and it's working to erode our rights and women's rights around the world. So instead of progress, we see stagnation in some countries, like in the UK, around trans rights, or even rapid deterioration. Think of Poland, think of Hungary. We're becoming in the UK globally famous for entrenched transphobia in our media and rapidly falling down the rankings in terms of LGBTQ plus rights because of our failure to take basic steps for our trans siblings. Things like re kind of introducing sensible approaches to gender recognition or supporting access to decent quality healthcare. And I think it's important to support and stand with our trans siblings, but recognize that those attacks are attacks on all of us. When they talk about removing trans people's rights under the Equality Act, they are talking about watering down protections at work, at school, in the community. When they talk about you know, restricting access to high quality transition related care, when they attack the bodily autonomy of trans people, they open up the road to attacks on bodily autonomy and access to reproductive and sexual health care. When we have this manufactured crisis around free speech in universities, it's about creating a culture where hateful or discriminatory speech is acceptable. There's so much here that is about the acceptability of racist speech, of eugenicist speech, of anti-Semitic speech. Speech. And when they launch 800 Freedom of Information uh, requests a month, yes, 800, for, to public bodies working with Stonewall, it's about creating a hostile environment for employers who want to be inclusive. It's also, of course, about shutting Stonewall up and shutting us down, right? feels hard because it's hard. It can some days feel like we're losing, but we have won before and we will win again and we will build up that wall of support for LGBTQ people in the workplace and in the community. So where do we go from here? Workplace organising is critical. We need to build common ground around a vision for the modern workplace brings activists, members, leaders, employers together around a vision that's inspirational for everyone. We need to celebrate how transformative, equitable, inclusive workplaces can be and how people thrive when they can be themselves at work. We need to show that this works, that it's good for everyone, that, that everyone wins when LGBTQ plus people win. We need to be ready to bat away the people who try and water down protections, drag us into false fights and undermine the consensus we've all fought so hard to achieve in support of LGBTQ people's dignity and rights, especially at work. We need to work together, campaign together, challenge together, fight together and partner across the union movement and the LGBTQ rights movement. And we need to make sure our political leaders get ready and lead and don't get dragged further into the trap of culture war. It feels hard, but we've done it before and we will do it again. And I look forward to doing it by your side.
thank you. Thank you very much, so much for your speech, um, Nancy. It's great you could make it to join us today. And um, we very much appreciate you being here. Over now to our next speaker. Um, we are going to be hearing from Charlotte. Charlotte Nichols is the Labour MP for Warrington North, and she's the Shadow Minister for Women and Equalities. Over to you, Charlotte. Thank you very much, Maria. Good afternoon, comrades, and Hag Purim Sameak to any of my fellow Jews present celebrating today. It's a pleasure to be here at my first TUC LGBT plus conference as a proud trade unionist and a union officer before coming into parliament. And I think it's uh, on a personal level, particularly poignant as um, my parents actually met through their trade union. So I can say that I literally owe my life to the movement. And, you know, following someone like Nancy who does so much, um, recent research from Stonewall actually says that bisexual people are actually the least likely to be out at work. And actually the first place that I was out at work was as a trade union officer at GMB. So the Labour Party was founded as the political wing of the trade union movement. And that relationship is an enduring one. In my own experience, whether it's the trade union branch activists who helped me get elected in a really hard fought win, or the network of experts and experience I can draw from, I know that I couldn't do my job without you guys. So thank you so much. And you help to shape the policies that Labour fights for, which is why events like today's are so important. So thank you for coming along to be part of that and for inviting me to join you. If Parliament now the quote, gayest parliament in the world with the biggest share of LGBT parliamentarians of any parliament in the world, equal marriage won and attitudes having moved on significantly in the last 20 years, there is a tendency in the public discourse to act as though LGBT equality has been achieved and we can all pack our bags and go home, something we all know that we're a long way from. Because there's a myriad of injustices which still blight our community and many parts of our community still not part of that policy making sphere or the public conversation. Something I'm going to try to touch on in this address as we look to how we can build a better and more equal society for everyone. In November last year, I was honoured to be asked to join the Shadow Women and Equalities team led by the excellent Shadow Secretary of State Marsha de Cordova and with Baroness Debbie Wilcox in the House of Lords, a fellow LGBT parliamentarian. And while we're a very small team, the work that we do cuts across every single government department from working with the shadow health team on issues such as black maternal mortality and smear tests on demand for the under 25s, to working with the shadow transport team on disabled passenger assistance on the railway, to working with the shadow DWP team on the disability pay gap and pressing the government at every opportunity for equality impact assessments of their policies to ensure that they're identifying and mitigating against the risk of different groups being disproportionately adversely affected. The government signalled their intention in a landmark speech by Liz Truss at the end of last year that they plan to have a shift in emphasis of the Government Equalities Office, focusing less on protected characteristics as defined in the Equalities Act and more on regional and class inequality. Now, for all of us here who will have experienced the sharp end of the last decade of austerity, the government suddenly caring about regional and class inequality will come as something of a surprise, not least when austerity disproportionately affected regions like mine in the Northwest. And indeed, they chose not to implement the so-called socioeconomic duty in the Equality Act that would have provided that protection, something Marsha is leading calls for them to do if they want to be taken seriously on this apparent aspiration. Of course, this is all a cover for the Tories' Trumpian war on woke, where we're seeing a concerted effort to whip up a culture war on a range of issues, with the suggestion that the progressive equalities agenda has gone too far. We know this not to be the case, but as the old adage says, a lie gets twice around the world before the truth has got its pants on. And with an often hostile press that's only too happy to help perpetuate myths, which can spread like wildfire unchecked on social media, 
it's important that our whole community comes together to stand alongside all those whose hard-won protections would be stripped away if the government started to unpick the Equality Act in the same way that they're seeking to do with the Human Rights Act using many of the same divide and rule tactics to turn people against legislation which is there to protect all of us. This year the parliamentary time like everything else has been dominated by coronavirus and with the virus disproportionately affecting those from marginalized or disadvantaged groups who already suffer poorer health outcomes it is clear that we are not all in this together. LGBT community is disproportionately impacted by HIV, which can lead to being immunocompromised, putting people at greater risk of becoming seriously ill if they contract COVID, meaning that people living with HIV are in priority group six for the vaccination. And it was really great to see my colleague Lloyd Russell Moyle, who was the first MP to disclose his HIV positive status in a parliamentary speech, and only the second MP to live openly with HIV receiving his vaccination today. Other risk factors include the higher incidence rate of smoking in the community, with smoking highest among by women, according to ONS data. The increased likelihood of homelessness affecting your ability to access treatment, as well as LGBT people often being more reluctant to access healthcare due to fears of encountering LGBT phobia. The impacts go much wider than this. Pride events which bring our community together have largely been cancelled or held online, which is increasing loneliness and isolation. Many LGBT young people will be more vulnerable confined to households where they're not out or are at greater risk of abuse if they are. And LGBT adults experiencing domestic abuse may find it more difficult to access discrete support, which is an issue when we know that the incidence rate of domestic violence in our community is higher than among the general population. Mental health support services are under increasing pressure with many charity phone lines reporting huge surges in demand during lockdown. And treatment including hormone therapy or gender confirmation surgeries for trans people may be disrupted or delayed as a result of pressures in the healthcare system too, exacerbating dysphoria and resulting mental health distress. Now, Speaking of trans healthcare and the Gender Recognition Act, which I know you're coming to debate in the next session, so I won't spend too long to save preempting that discussion, save to say that Labour is the party of equality committed to achieving a world free from all forms of bigotry and discrimination. Whether it's campaigning on the streets or passing legislation in government, Labour is the only party to consistently stand with women, disabled people, people from ethnic minority backgrounds and LGBT plus communities. The Tory government spent two years leading people up the hill and then left them standing there last September when it announced it would not be making any reforms to the GRA after all. Labour remains committed to ensuring trans people can live their lives with equality, dignity and respect. We will resist any attempts to roll back hard-won rights and we're committed to updating the Gender Recognition Act 2004 to introduce self-declaration for trans people. Labour is proud to be the party of the Equality Act, which made discrimination on the grounds of gender identity illegal. And we're also proud of the single sex exemption, which permits the commissioning of women only services. These provisions rightly assume the inclusion of trans women, except in very specific circumstances. Outside of GRA reform, which is part of the puzzle, healthcare inequality in the trans community is stark with significant waiting lists for treatment. I'm proud of Labour's record on trans equality and want to work with yourselves to ensure that with no trans MPs out in Parliament, that trans voices are heard and decisions about trans people are not made without trans people. This year, the phenomenal success of Channel 4's It's a Sin has led to a record number of HIV tests being applied for in National HIV Testing Week earlier this month. 
And I was really proud that work by LGBT colleagues and campaigners in Parliament has secured the win that HIV clinics are able to arrange the COVID vaccination for people living with HIV if they don't want to disclose their status to their GP, something first introduced by the Labour government in Wales in recognition of the fact that up to a quarter of people with HIV feel unable to speak to their GP about it. It's a sin has also helped to broaden the debate about our international obligations to eradicate HIV, something I'm concerned about our progress on following the government decision to merge the Department for International Development into the Department for Foreign and Commonwealth Office. So the Women and Equalities team will be working with colleagues across the House to ensure that we don't start to fall behind on those obligations. And we're also working closely with the Shadow Home Office team to see the end of degrading tests for LGBT asylum seekers to prove that they are LGBT, which strip them of their dignity, add to the trauma of the process and can mean getting sent back to persecution. Finally, we are seeing an alarming rise in LGBT hate crime, including online, something that I've experienced alongside far too many of us present today. I'm really proud of the work that Labour's doing on online harms to hold social media and tech companies accountable for hate on their platforms. But I'm most proud of the work that's being done to ensure our curriculum is LGBT inclusive, to educate the next generation not to carry forward this bigotry and to address the scourge of bullying of LGBT young people in our schools. No one is born homophobic, biphobic or transphobic. These are learned behaviours ingrained and reinforced by society as we grow up and they can be just as easily unlearned as they are learned. So thank you for having me with you today as we grapple with these issues and come up with solutions to see that better and more equal society. And I look forward to listening to more of the day's discussion.